This is Lawmakers, your source for all the news from under the Gold Dome. Here are your anchors, and Wandy Lawson and David Zelsky. Tonight on Lawmakers, it is the Legislative Day 20, the halfway point for the 2007 session. And an anti-immigration measure turns into a debate over sex offender sentencing. Legislation that would provide for a life without parole sentence without first seeking the death penalty is introduced. The Senate fails to pass a measure that would change the way state government spends tax dollars. And the USDA announces a $2 billion initiative that could bring money Georgia's way. But our lead story tonight, debate in the Senate, takes an unexpected turn. The Senate passed a bill today that would restrict local governments from preventing their courts from considering immigration when setting bail. Debate over the bill got sidetracked when Senator Emanuel Jones offered an amendment that would make some of Georgia's newest sex offender laws retroactive. Lawmakers Jesse Freeman joins us live with the story. Jesse. All session, Senator Emanuel Jones has been working to free a young man convicted of aggravated sexual molestation. The letter of the law that landed him in jail was changed last session, but wasn't made retroactive. Jones tried to force that issue with an amendment to Senate Bill 23, dealing with sanctuary cities. It's a terrible idea, and we don't have any sanctuary cities in Georgia right now. They're mostly major metropolitan cities in California and in the Northeast. Uh, and the bill that uh, we should discuss today, Senate Bill 23, uh, while it wouldn't outlaw sanctuary cities in Georgia, it would prevent sanctuary city movement from interfering with what judges and the parole board do. There was almost no discussion of Senate Bill 23 on the floor. That was saved for an amendment by Senator Emanuel Jones. About three weeks ago, I came to the well and spoke to you about a kid who I met that had been incarcerated down in Burris Prison, a kid by the name of Gennaro Wilson. And after meeting this kid in Burris down in Forsyth, I came back with a renewed spirit and determined that I was going to do everything that I could to see to it that this kid gets released from the jail cells that he's been confined in. It does seem that this amendment is putting the legislature in, into the judiciary branch. It is my understanding that in Janolo Wilson case, had that young man done the same thing today as was done several years ago, he would not be locked away in a prison cell with 10 years to serve. After debate on the amendment, Senator Douglas asked for a ruling on germaneness. The amendment is ruled non-germane. The amendment was a uh, total was a surprise to me. Uh, I had no idea that it was coming. I thought that it was uh, uh, a good ruling from the chair that it was not uh, appropriate to the, to the bill. Senate Bill 23 ultimately passed by a vote of 50 to 2. Now, Senator Jones has pledged to keep working to free Wilson. He has filed legislation that currently sits in the Senate Special Judiciary Committee. Reporting live, I'm Jesse Freeman for Lawmakers. Thank you, Jesse. A bill that gives a trial judge the discretion of where convicts stay during their appeal process passed the Senate today. Senator Joseph Carter explains the effect of Senate Bill 48. What this bill simply does is it restores discretion in the trial judge. And so the process would be, if this passes, that the defendant could still remain locally uh, at the request of defense counsel, but the court would make inquiry as to whether or not there was a need for that person to remain in the county jail. Senate Bill 48 passed unanimously and now heads to the House. Senate, uh, Senator has introduced a bill that could cut down on the number of death penalty cases tried in Georgia. Lawmaker Sandra Paris now joins us with more. Sandra. In Wandy, Senate Bill 145 by Senator Preston Smith would allow prosecutors the option of seeking life without parole in murder cases, something they currently don't have. Right now, the only two options in a murder case are life with parole or the death penalty. Senator Preston Smith says his bill would actually cut down on costly death penalty cases by allowing prosecutors more options. This gives the prosecutors an opportunity to pursue a guilty verdict and lock the person up, but not have to go through the death penalty trial phase, which, as you know, is extremely expensive and very time-consuming and often results in life without parole anyway. It's a bill that prosecutors like. Cobb District Attorney Pat Head tells me there are cases he's tried where life without parole would have been more suitable. Well, for years, prosecutors have, I guess, looked at having to file seeking the death penalty in order to get life without parole. That was our only option. And we have had discussions for a number of years about how we could go about trying to change that. I think this bill will now give us a little more flexibility 
without having to go through the expense of a death penalty trial in order to obtain what we think would be a fair sentence in a case. Even defense attorneys say a sentence of life without parole makes sense. Manny Aurora says he's defended numerous death penalty cases where that was the end result anyway. I just wish we could have done that up front and we could have saved the clients two or three years of grief because once our investigation was done and it looked grim basically for us, it was a matter of settling it. And if we could do that in a few months versus a few years, think of all the resources that'd be saved. And making somebody go through a death penalty and all the emotional turmoil that goes on with that just to get to a life without parole sentence, it's just really unfair to all the parties involved, the victims, the defendants, everybody. Now, because Senate Bill 145 has been assigned to the Senate Judiciary Committee, the same committee that Smith chairs, it likely has a good chance of passing at least out of committee. No word yet when a hearing will be scheduled. Reporting live from the Capitol, I'm Sandra Parrish for Lawmakers. Thanks, Sandra. Legislation that allows electronic fingerprint transfers passed the Senate today. Senator Jeff Mullis, who sponsors Senate Bill 62, explains how this measure could modernize law enforcement capabilities. Senate Bill 62 uh, helps bring the um, Georgia Crime Information Center into the modern, his into modern times by allowing the transfer of fingerprints through electronic means. Uh, currently, there are 23 separate codes that, that um, protects the identity of this and allows the electronic means only through a pr authorized and approved subdivision of our government. This has been brought to me by the GBI. Senate Bill 62 passed by a vote of 53 to 0 and now heads to the House. A proposal for a constitutional amendment that provides limitations on state government taxation and spending failed to pass the Senate today. Senate Resolution 20, known as the Taxpayer Protection Amendment of 2007, needed a two-thirds majority to pass. It was four votes shy. Senator Chip Rogers sponsors Senate Resolution 20. We're going to spend the money that you send us, but if you send us more money than we believe is necessary to run the basic fundamentals of government, that excess money is going to go to four places. Reduce debt, reduce taxes, uh, put into a reserve fund, or to pay for education. Several Democrats opposing the amendment argued that similar measures have failed in other states. I've actually talked to individuals out there in Colorado, folks who actually were involved in this, elected officials like us, former state, state representative Brad Young, and I also talked with who is now their minority leader in the House, Representative Steve Johnson. And the one advice they gave to me don't do it. The resolution needed 38 votes to pass. It received 34. However, one Republican senator was absent. The Senate will vote to reconsider this Tuesday. I hope the citizens let their voice be heard that they want to vote on this. They want a chance to let their voice be known on this particular issue. It is their money after all. And, uh, and we think that's the right thing to do. So I will make that plea to my colleagues who voted against this. Our senators and our representatives understand that we face big challenges in meeting the health needs and the education needs of Georgians. I think the people that voted today to block this Tabor amendment that failed when it was applied in California are going to vote again on Tuesday. If the Tuesday vote total changes 238 in favor and the House passes it also with the two-thirds majority, the amendment will appear on the ballot reading, shall the Constitution of Georgia be amended so as to provide for limitations on state government taxation and expenditures. And the voters check yes or no. The people understand this. It's a pretty basic premise and they ought to have the right to have their voice heard. Again, Senate Resolution 20 failed 34 to 21 and the vote to reconsider is expected Tuesday. The review committee of the Joint Legislative Ethics Committee today dismissed an ethics complaint against House Ways and Means Chairman Larry O'Neill. The complaint alleged that Chairman O'Neill used his influence to create tax breaks on land purchases for Governor Perdue back in 2005. The Legislative Ethics Committee Chairman, Senate President Pro Tem Eric Johnson, stated in response that the committee cannot and will not be used as a political tool by either party or by partisans who seek a political advantage and not the truth. The House Appropriations Vice Chair was flanked by Metro Atlanta business leaders today when he announced a plan to allow counties to use special purpose local option sales taxes to fund local road projects. Representative Chuck Martin opened the press conference asking, are you tired of sitting in traffic? Traffic and congestion is the number one problem. And it's the number one problem for recruitment. It's the number one problem for, of new companies, number one problem of quality of life for our employees. So. 
of any of the issues that can come up from a business perspective, this is, this is the top issue. If Metro Atlanta puts this into practice and decides to uh, fund its transportation in this matter, Northwest Georgia is not required to, Northeast Georgia, South, it, it, it puts those hands, two or more counties that get together and follow the um, outlines in the bill can, can implement this. It does not require the entire state to do that, and I think that's why this is our best chance to solve the problem that we've had in 10 to 15 years. Representative Bob Holmes has introduced a similar measure, House Bill 173. And hopefully we can pick the best parts of both of them and come up with something that would truly provide a means by which not only Atlanta Metro, but also the entire state can in fact benefit by having a dedicated source of revenue uh, for in fact dealing with their local as well as the regional uh, transportation needs. We're not going to rush through something just to, to try to get it out and, and ruin the process. But sure, I, I would hope we could talk through the um, situation. We have to realize we're on day 20. We have to talk through this and get it over to the Senate by day 30 unless we find a, an alternative uh, method uh, in which to work with them. So I would hope that, but if we could not do that this year, I, I think we'll have ongoing discussions and, and absolutely look to do that in 2008. House Bills 434 and 173 are in the House Ways and Means Committee. Well, Brain Train Day at the Capitol today was intended to promote rail transportation in Georgia. It also drew fire from one opponent of commuter rail who used Brain Train props to make his point. I had a good fun in nature. I, I, I figured I'd wear my Brain Train hat. But I want to let everybody know it's not really that funny. This is not a cartoon. It's not fiction. This is not Thomas the Train. You can't say... I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, and it happens. This is real money, taxpayer money. We need to get the real facts on commuter rail, folks. It won't work in Georgia. The largest word on the, on the emblem is think. And I would just like to take this opportunity that uh, each of you would at least put aside the rhetoric about commuter rail and just think, consider for a moment that it could be a good thing. There are benefits, possibly, to the brain train. It could help our emerging corridor of bioscience, our university system connecting Athens to Atlanta and educational points in between, like our new Georgia Gwinnett College, for example. The brain train could, just think, save lives, reduce commuter time. I think it might be a good investment. Davis is the sponsor of a proposal to abolish the Georgia Rail Authority. House Bill 268 is currently in the Transportation Committee. The Senate had a special guest today from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Stone Workman, a Bush appointee, is the state director for the USDA and spoke to the Senate about a bill in Congress that has the potential of bringing Georgia a large portion of a $2 billion initiative. The recent announcement of an ethanol manufacturing plan in Trutland County could help bring this money to Georgia. Cellulostic ethanol. Uh, get to know that term. It's just uh, Georgia is one big photo cell. The power comes from the sun to our pine trees, and we have to get that power out of the pine trees. Uh, Senator um, Saxby Chambliss is putting 2.6 billion, that's with a B, into the budget for cellulosic ethanol. That money can all, most of it can come to Georgia. We need to work together to make sure it's written in a way that Georgia and the Southeast can get this federal money for cellulosic ethanol. Legislation currently in a House committee would create a tax exemption for the construction of these biofuel facilities. The House today agreed to a simplified form of making end-of-life decisions. House Bill 24 creates a combined living will and durable power of attorney for health care. Representative Wendell Willard explained that the measure was actually born out of a mistake. We were trying to change that form that we had, the one-page form, to make it more understandable and readable to an individual. Uh, we passed the bill through both houses, and then afterwards we recognized uh, there was some mistakes made to what we had language-wise, and unfortunately we had to ask the governor to veto the bill. But it worked out, I think, as a good thing. So while something may have been a, what we thought at first a problem, something good happened. The thing that we've done is we've set up a form that doesn't require you going to a lawyer to get it put together. You can have a nurse talk to you about it. You can have your minister talk to you about it. House Bill 24 passed without opposition and moves to the Senate. The House also decided to reduce liability for tow truck drivers clearing highway wrecks. Representative Vance Smith presents House Bill 231. 
In times past, they have been sued because of damage to the vehicle that was in the wreck. This bill states that if they're directed by State Patrol or the fire department, the firemen there, or DOT, if they're directed to move that vehicle to open these four or five or however many lanes of traffic, that they can do so and not have to worry about being held liable except for gross negligence. House Bill 231 passed 158 to 3. It moves to the Senate. We're at the halfway mark for this legislative session, and on day 20, we bring you our legislative scorecard, beginning with the budget, the only legislation that the General Assembly is required to pass. Without an answer for how to fund a shortfall in the Peach Care for Kids insurance program, House Bill 94, the FY 2007 supplemental budget, remains in the House Appropriations Committee, along with the 2008 budget. A push to remove the prohibition on payday lending is in the House Banks and Banking Subcommittee. Senate Bill 82, to allow residents of Dunwoody to vote on whether to become a city, has passed the Senate. It's currently in the House Governmental Affairs Committee. Governor Purdue's proposal to restrict lottery funds to pre-K education and HOPE scholarships is currently in Senate rules. Yesterday, the Senate passed the Grade Integrity Act to protect teachers from being forced to change grades. A renewal of the annual sales tax exemption for school supplies in early August and for energy efficient appliances in the fall is being considered by the House Ways and Means Committee. Emerging biofuel companies would be exempted from sales tax on the construction of their facilities if HB 186 clears the General Assembly. Currently the measure is in the House Ways and Means Committee. A controversial ban on abortions is currently being considered by the House Judiciary Committee. House Bill 21, making English the official language of Georgia, is currently in the House Judiciary Committee. The Senate today passed a measure to require the Board of Pardons and Parole to consider the immigration status of prisoners for probation and sentencing. The Senate passed the Real ID Act in opposition to proposed federal guidelines about a universal form of identification. Senate Bill 5 is now in the House Motor Vehicles Committee. The Senate also agreed to require that Georgia drivers have valid licenses before applying for auto license plates. Among the measures offered by citizens on the GeorgiaSpeaks.com website is SB1, prohibiting sex offenders from photographing minors. The Senate passed the bill on Monday. It is now in the House Judiciary Committee. A prison warden suggested a law to keep inmates from displaying photos of their victims. SB 34 passed the Senate last week. It is currently in the House Judiciary Committee. Senate Bill 71 would require that special elections be held in March or November. It passed the Senate and is now in House Governmental Affairs. The Senate agreed to require adults to wear seatbelts in pickup trucks. SB 86 passed the Senate and moved to the House Governmental Affairs Committee. A plan to expand the ways attorneys qualify to take the state bar exam beyond accredited law schools is currently in the House Judiciary Committee. And the Senate Judiciary Committee is currently considering whether to add imprisonment for life without parole to the potential sentences for murder. And that's the Day 20 Legislative Scorecard. School principals may soon have a business manager to help with financial and business affairs. Senate Bill 72, which passed the Senate today, creates that position. Senate Majority Leader Tommy Williams explains. The impetus for the bill came about in studying the British system of governance in, um, in public school, whereby they, they have a, uh, a bursar, what they call a bursar, in the school system that takes care of all of the financial uh, parts, uh, business parts of the school and allows the principal the opportunity to uh, be engaged in the instructional uh, aspect of school. And I think this would free up our uh, principals to do the job they really need to be doing and not worry about whether the roof is leaking or the bus is arriving on time or, or all those uh, uh, parts that are distracting to, to education. Now, one change made in the committee process is that someone hired for this position must have at least a bachelor's degree. Senate Bill 72 passed by a vote of 49 to 4 and now goes to the House. 
The HOPE Scholarship was the center of discussion at the House Higher Education Committee meeting earlier today. House Minority Leader DeBose Porter introduced House Bill 228, which seeks to encourage participation in joint enrollment programs by high school students. The bill says that courses taken at local colleges or technical schools by high school juniors and seniors will not count against their total number of HOPE Scholarship hours once they graduate. The bill also removes the current cap of two technical degrees laid out in the HOPE grant. Representative Porter explains that allowing Georgians to pursue more than two technical degrees under the HOPE grant enables them to respond to changing economies. If you have the uh, opportunity to, to change with the job changes in the state as the economy changes, then you would be able to get that grant, go to school, get retrained for that next job that's coming into your community, and keep you working in your community. House Bill 228 remains in committee for further discussion. It was Home Education Day at the Capitol today. More than 100 families visited with legislators to drum up support for a key issue that continues to affect homeschool students. Lawmakers Quandra Collins has that story. Many of our colleges, including Georgia Perimeter and Kennesaw, are now telling our homeschooling families, well, you don't have an approved curriculum, and we're not going to let you in this joint enroll program. And I want to just publicly ask Speaker Richardson and ask Casey Cagle, our lieutenant governor, and even if we have to get Governor Purdue involved, he will, and we need to get this straightened out. In previous years, Echo says homeschool students have been required to take additional tests to prove their level of competency. Unfortunately, our Board of Regents sometimes uh, monkey with, with us. Uh, I remember back when Governor Barnes was governor, they wanted all of our homeschoolers to take all seven SAT2 subject tests. They were turning away kids with 1,400, sometimes 1,500. I remember one girl, Katherine Hackler from, from Lilburn, they turned, Georgia State turned her away with a 1,500 SAT score. Homeschooling supporters say they hope their presence here at the Capitol will be made known and hopefully push for legislation that will make their curriculum approved in state institutions. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Quandra Collins. We attempted to reach officials at Kennesaw State University, Georgia Perimeter College, and the Board of Regents earlier today, but at this time we have not yet received a reply. Legislation that would create four-year terms of office for members of the General Assembly was introduced before a subcommittee today. Representative Mike Cowan, sponsor of House Resolution 2, explains. Honestly, a lot of our constituents think we serve four-year terms already, just like their school board members and just like their county commissioners and their city council people and all the local people that are on uh, four-year terms. I've talked to a lot of people that um, about this bill and... 90% uh, of the people, more than 90%, have been in favor of a change. It's been a long time since this has been attempted in Georgia. I haven't been able really to find out when. I think it might have been back in the 60s. Now only five other states have adopted four-year terms of office for their lawmakers, including Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Maryland, and North Dakota. The resolution passed unanimously out of subcommittee and now goes to the full House Governmental Affairs Committee. Representative Cowan also presented the Fair Campaign Practices Act, a bill that seeks to outlaw negative campaign ads. When I first began to think about this bill, I thought a way, uh, was thought about really a way just to outlaw negative campaigning. But then I began to realize, and as I thought it through, there's not really a way to do that, but there doesn't need to be a way to do that. This ought to be something that we, if we decide to, we step up and willingly do this. And um, this bill is an opportunity for candidates to voluntarily do uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about here, which is just to take a higher ethical standard, just take the high road. House Bill 25 remains in subcommittee for further review. Senator David Schaefer has filed legislation that would set up a commission to promote and foster non-embryonic stem cell research. He says he filed Senate Bill 148 to provide direction for stem cell research in the state. It creates a newborn umbilical cord blood bank and encourages universal collection of postnatal tissue and fluid, which is rich in stem cells, which can be used to, for research and treatment without destroying human life at any stage of development. Senator Schaefer's bill leaves out the more controversial type of stem, stem cell research that focuses on expired embryos. He says he disputes claims that this sort of research may yield more results. Stem cell research is controversial because you have to destroy a human embryo in order to obtain the stem cells. Embryonic stem cell research also has not been shown to cure any disease 
um, or, or alleviate any uh, suffering. Uh, embryonic stem cells are difficult to control in the laboratory and they tend to mutate into dangerous cancers. I'm convinced that uh, non-embryonic stem cell research, non-destructive stem cell research is the way that we should go. Senate Bill 148 now awaits action in the Senate Science and Technology Committee. The chairman, Senator Cecil Staten, is a co-signer of SB 148. Over 90 students involved with Teen Pact, a political youth organization, gathered on the steps of the Capitol earlier today. They came to show support for House Bill 1, which proposes to make abortion illegal in Georgia. Lawmakers Bridget Snap has that story. One second after birth, killing a child is considered murder. One second before birth, it is considered abortion. Can you tell me, what is the difference? I'll tell you that pregnancy is a privilege. And those who become so should think of the consequences. They should be ready to face them, not hide from them, especially in such a brutal way. Join me in, abol in abolishing the murder of innocent and living children. High school student Kevin Eden explains what Team Pact is. Team Pact is a youth political leadership program designed to get students my age encouraged to uh, be active and participate in the many, many, many uh, political sources, I mean just, you know, volunteering things like that to get active and make a difference in the government. Today's event follows in the footsteps of several other press conferences held this session in support of HB1. The bill is currently before the Judiciary Committee. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Bridget Snap. Members of Georgia's Rural Health Association convened at the Capitol yesterday to discuss medical care plans for rural Georgia, peach care, and future legislation that would help rural Georgians. Lawmakers Rick Wheatman has more. The Georgia Rural Health Association, or GRHA, is a nonprofit organization established in 1981 to preserve and improve health care for rural Georgians. Health care plans available to those in rural areas range from Medicare and Medicaid to the deployment of radiologists to treat cancer patients that cannot travel to accredited hospitals. It will let somebody in a small community that doesn't always have access to a radiologist at any time, 24 hours a day, all the radiology is digitized, x-ray, CAT scans, MRIs, whatever. It's digitized, it's sent to a place, it comes back in less than an hour, also times 30, 40 minutes it'll come back. In addition this year, the GRHA seeks to increase trauma centers and address child obesity. The question of if the GRHA agenda gets attention from lawmakers may depend on what happens with peach care in the remaining session. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Rick Wheatman. Well, coming up tomorrow on Lawmakers, it's the end of another legislative week. That means it's time to talk with Tom Crawford of CapitalImpact.com. And the funeral of Congressman Charlie Norwood is expected in Augusta tomorrow. House members are supposed to share remembrances of the congressman tomorrow morning. We'll have highlights of those speeches and all the latest from under the Gold Dome. That's tomorrow night at 7. If you've missed any part of this Lawmakers broadcast, be sure to tune in tomorrow morning when Lawmakers repeats at 5.30 a.m. Now, stay tuned for Georgia Outdoors. Tonight's episode features the red. Hills region. Georgia Outdoors is coming up next year on GPB. And that is our broadcast for this, the 20th legislative day of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm David Zelsky. And I'm Wandy Lawson. Thanks so much for joining us and have a great evening.